When delving into the shadows of Edinburgh's murky history, two names emerge with undeniable prominence, unfolding a chilling tale that permeates the cityscape. As the fog of time lifts, the figures of Burke and Hare come into sharp focus, towering above any others. Their tales, like lingering echoes, resonate through cobblestone streets and hidden corners, revealing a haunting chapter in the capital's past. These infamous individuals, with their grim exploits in the early 19th century, cast a sinister revelation, leaving an indelible mark on Edinburgh's history, a mark that lingers in the collective memory, a reminder of the unsettling shadows that once cloaked the city. As the pall of history unfolds, the ominous presence of Burke and Hare sharpens. Shrouded in a cloak of malevolence and greed, they exploited their perceived status to lure unsuspecting victims into the dark recesses of Edinburgh's narrow closes and labyrinthine streets. The closes, with winding paths and concealed corners, became the sinister stage for gruesome acts. Navigating the maze-like network of narrow closes, Burke and Hare capitalised on the anonymity afforded by the cramped confines of the city streets. Amidst claustrophobic passages and dimly lit thoroughfares, they preyed upon the vulnerable, their footsteps muffled by cobblestones as they stalked their unwitting targets. In the shadows of towering tenements and hidden alcoves, fear mingled with the dense fog shrouding the city creating an atmosphere ripe for exploitation. With each step, unsuspecting souls drawn into their web unwittingly sealed their fate, their final moments spent amidst the eerie silence of Edinburgh's serpentine streets. As echoes of their harrowing tale reverberate through time, narrow closes and winding streets bear witness to the chilling legacy of Burke and Hare, forever intertwined with the dark hearts of the city. Over merely 10 months, this murderous pair claimed 16 lives, men, women and children. Operating under the guise of offering hospitality and shelter, they enticed unsuspecting victims into Hare's lodging house. Once there, victims were plied with whisky, enough to put them to sleep, before being smothered in a manner developed by the pair to avoid easy detection. After victims ceased struggling, Burke and Hare concealed lifeless bodies in barrels, brazenly rolling them through the city streets to the eagerly awaiting Dr Knox. Knox paid anywhere from £7 to £10 for each fresh body, with prices increasing in winter due to the cold temperature slowing decomposition. The duo's killing spree began in late November 1827, when Donald, a lodger in Hare's house, passed away due to dropsy just before receiving a quarterly army pension, leaving four pounds in unpaid back rent. Following Hare's lamentation about financial loss to Burke, the duo decided to sell Donald's body to a local anatomist. After procuring a coffin from a carpenter intended for a parish paid burial, they covertly opened it, substituted the body with bark and resealed it. Under the cover of darkness, on the day of the scheduled burial, they transported the corpse to Edinburgh University. Initially, they sought Professor Munro, but eventually ended up at Dr Knox's premises on Surgeon Square. Knox, although represented by a junior associate, initially ultimately fixed the price at £7.10. Shillings. Hare received £4.05, shillings, while Burke claimed the remaining £3.05. Shillings. The order of subsequent murders remains unclear, with discrepancies between Burke's confessions, Hare's statement and contemporary reports. Notably, nefarious activities continued, involving various victims, ingenious methods of murder and transactions with Dr Knox, culminating in a total of 16 lives claimed by Burke and Hare. Their gruesome actions, fueled by intoxication and a twisted moral compass, came to a halt when suspicion arose around the death of Margaret Doherty, leading to their arrest and the revelation of their horrifying spree. The last victim, Margaret Doherty, met her tragic end on October the 31st, 1828. Burke enticed her into the Brogan lodging house, claiming familial ties to the Doherty name. 
The evening commenced with drinking and at a juncture, Burke left Doherty in the company of MacDougall to fetch hair. To facilitate their sinister plans, they paid their other lodgers, Anne and James Grey, to stay elsewhere, feigning Doherty as a relative. As the night unfolded, the Greys briefly returned to collect clothing and witnessed a scene of inebriation, with Burke, Hare, their wives and Doherty singing and dancing. Amidst a disagreement with Burke and Hare, Doherty was subsequently murdered, her lifeless body concealed in a pile of clothes by the bed. The following day, upon the Greys' return, Anne's suspicion heightened as Burke prevented her from approaching a bed where she had left her stockings. Left alone in the house during the early evening, the Greys, driven by unease, searched the straw and uncovered Doherty's lifeless form, bearing visible signs of blood and saliva. While en route to the authorities, they encountered MacDougall, who attempted to sway them with a £10 per week bribe an offer staunchly declined by the Greys. As the Greys reported the murder to the police, Burke and Hare clandestinely transported the body to Knox's surgery. Subsequent police investigations uncovered Doherty's bloodstained clothing concealed beneath the bed. When questioned, Burke and his wife offered conflicting accounts of Doherty's departure, raising enough suspicion for their detainment. In the early morning, authorities visited Knox's dissecting rooms, discovering Doherty's remains. James positively identified her as the woman seen with Burke and Hare. On that day, Hare and his wife, along with Brogan, were arrested, each vehemently disclaiming any knowledge of the harrowing events. This brought about the end of the murderous spree of Burke and Hare. During the 19th century, Burke and Hare cast a chilling shadow upon the streets of Edinburgh, leaving an indelible mark upon its history. Today, whispers persist that their spectral presence has shifted from the city's surface to an unseen realm beneath, haunting the depths of the Edinburgh vaults. Edinburgh's South Bridge stands as a monumental achievement in 18th century engineering, yet beneath its grandeur lies a tale of superstition and eerie evolution. Built to connect the Old Town's High Street with the university's buildings on the south side of the city, this modern highway required sacrifices. Three closes, Marlin's Wind, Peebles Wind and Nidri's Wind, vanished from the Cowgate area reshaping a quarter renowned for its destitution. Constructed in 1785, the South Bridge boasted 19 stone arches, spanning over 1,000 feet and reaching 31 feet above the ground. Despite the completion of the South Bridge in 1788, the opening of the bridge was met with great anxiety. To honour a commitment made before her untimely death, the first resident to cross the bridge did so in a coffin. The woman who'd been given permission to be the first person to cross had died shortly before the opening, but given the promise made to her before her death, her wish was granted. This macabre incident fueled rumours of a curse, causing most locals to shun the bridge and opt for the inconvenient route through the Cowgate. Over time, the South Bridge transformed into prime real estate, commanding premium prices. Shop fronts lined the top of the bridge and tenement houses occupied most arches, leaving only the Cowgate Arch visible today. Yet as businesses thrived above, the blocked-in arches beneath became dark, airless, vaulted chambers used for workshops and storage. Unfortunately, the lack of waterproofing, budget constraints and the resultant leaks led to a decline in living conditions. As legitimate businesses abandoned the vaults, the destitute found shelter. However, by the mid-19th century, the vaults were abandoned and filled with rubble to discourage squatters. In 1985, a fortuitous excavation unearthed these forgotten spaces, revealing a labyrinthic network of rooms. 
Despite the passage of time, the vaults retain their original atmosphere. Dark, occasionally claustrophobic and damp, oozing memories of Edinburgh's past and invoking the imagination. And many people, including myself, believe them to be haunted. Soon after their discovery, the vaults were opened to the public and almost immediately people started reporting strange and unusual encounters. It didn't take long for the enigmatic catacombs to gain a reputation as one of the world's most haunted locations. The vaults are split into different chambers or rooms and many of these rooms started to earn unwanted reputations. In this episode, we'll explore each of the haunted rooms, uncovering the chilling mysteries that lie within the shadows of Edinburgh's historic underground. The room, known as the Cobbler's Room, hosts the presence of a cheerful spirit, believed to be a shoemaker from the late 1700s or early 1800s. The Cobbler is believed to persist, passionately continuing his craft beyond the boundaries of the living. Initially sighted in 1997 in the southwest corner of his room, where he's often seen, he's described as a stout, bald figure in his early 50s. He's said to wear a leather apron over a white shirt and is often witnessed happily working on a shoe while seated on a bench. His friendly nature is evident through perpetual smiles and laughter, creating a welcoming atmosphere for those in his spectral company. He's said to have a keen interest in people's footwear, and he's known to playfully tug at shoelaces. Remarkably affable, this ghostly artisan has earned such trust that psychics recommend seeking refuge in the cobbler's room during paranormal disturbances. His robust and friendly presence serves as a protective force, warding off malevolent spirits and ensuring the well-being of those who venture into his spirited domain. The cobbler's room is also the haunt of a female presence and a mysterious poltergeist that throws stones around the room. Many people report seeing a woman wearing a veiled black dress standing in the northwest corner of the room. She appears distraught, as if she's in mourning. Psychics who visited feel her intense grief is due to her losing her only child in a horrific way. I've had my own experience in the cobbler's room when I joined a tour in 2014. Standing towards the back of the group and near the entrance into the room, I listened to the tour guide expertly weaving the tale of some of the recent sightings of the cobbler's ghost. After a minute or so, my attention was taken by a noise behind me and to the right, coming from the empty corridor. I turned to identify the source of the noise, anticipating a straggler from the tour gingerly sneaking into the room, but found no one. I took a step out into the corridor for a better look, but again it was empty, although I could hear the noise from other guides echoing along the corridor, so I assumed what I'd heard came from them. Stepping back into the room, I returned to the spot where I'd previously stood and put the noise behind me, until I heard another noise which was much closer. To my right, about three feet from me and about one foot above the ground, I'd heard the unmistakable sound of a dog growling. I took a step to my left and turned to look at the area I thought the sound had come from and noticed that an American couple, about six feet from me, were looking at the same area I'd heard the growl come from. Did you hear that? I asked. Yes, was the reply. I inquired further. What did you hear? To which the visibly confused American replied. It sounded like, like a dog growling. We asked the guide if a dog had ever been heard in the room before, but he wasn't aware of any reports. Is it possible we heard the growl of another spirit said to linger in the vaults, the ghost of the caretaker's dog? The caretaker, often spotted in a separate room, is generally seen with a faithful terrier by his side. Could the ghostly growl I heard have been the caretaker's dog making his presence known? In the Nidri Street vaults, there's a corridor that runs the length of the vault, where the room branches off either side. The corridor was one of the first areas to report ghostly goings on, and it may be home to one of the most sinister presences in the city. For decades, visitors to the corridor have reported seeing the ominous spirit of a large, imposing man 
who said to wear a blue overcoat that's covered in dirt hiding in the shadows. Those who've seen him say he has a terrifying energy to him, as if those who are in his presence are trespassing on his territory. Some even claim to have seen him watching with an unsettling intensity, his hand gripping a large sharp knife, its glint occasionally catching the emergency lighting, adding an extra layer of unease to the section of the Edinburgh vaults. The vaults were originally used to store various goods, including wine, due to their underground location and relatively stable temperatures. They provided a cool and dark environment ideal for preserving wine, protecting it from temperature fluctuations and sunlight. However, there's one vault that may also have managed to harbour another kind of spirit, the ghost of a young boy. The spirit, often identified as Jack or James, frequently appears in the wine vault. He's estimated to be between six and eight years old, sporting blonde curly hair and attired in a blue suit with knickerbocker trousers and a white shirt. He can often be found observing visitors from lower shells and occasionally moves about, especially when groups are present. He displays affection for other children and exhibits a preference for holding hands with women, seemingly seeking a maternal figure. <laughs> Jack is often heard rather than seen. His gentle singing can sometimes be heard echoing through the dark, eerie vaults. Some visitors have picked up on the feeling that Jack harbours a very real fear of the dominant energy whose presence infests the network of vaults, Mr Boots. Seeking refuge, Jack sometimes retreats to the cobbler's room, where he feels a sense of security. A good soul, he's protective of some who venture into the vaults, and is known to tug sharply on individual sleeves or coats in an attempt to dissuade them from entering the area where Boots is at his strongest. In the tavern room, amidst the gritty backdrop often associated with Edinburgh's destitute and underworld, lurks an unexpected presence, a male spirit known as the Aristocrat. Always seen standing, leaning against a wall, the Aristocrat is believed to be Finian Mackenzie, a figure named by psychics. Described as outwardly friendly, he wears a curious expression and offers a welcoming smile to those fortunate enough to encounter him. Some speculate he may have been associated with Edinburgh's notorious Hellfire Club, which met within these very vaults. However, alongside the aristocrat, a more sinister presence haunts the tavern room. A black shape is often glimpsed, darting in and out of the shadows, sending shivers down the spine of any witness. Horrifyingly, this wraith has even been witnessed crawling along the vaulted ceiling, above the heads of the unsuspecting tourists. Given the dark associations of the Hellfire Club and the rumours of their ties to the occult, one can't help but wonder if the aristocrat's seemingly welcoming demeanour masks a deeper, more malevolent truth lurking within the tavern room's shadows. Within the vaults lies the Double height Room, a vast chamber that stretches upwards into the darkness. Its towering walls and echoing footsteps create an atmosphere steeped in history and mystery. Despite its large size, the room feels eerie, with torchlight casting unsettling shadows on the ancient stones. Some visitors sense a chill in the air, as if unseen eyes are watching them from the darkness. Yet there's a certain fascination to the double height room, with its towering arches and ancient pillars, and that fascination could be because it's also haunted. In 2005, a woman reported seeing a figure resembling none other than President Abraham Lincoln near the door at the top of the floor. She watched him for a few seconds before he turned and walked away. Some believe this figure is also the aristocrat who haunts the tavern room. Witnesses have also reported seeing the spectral form of a naked man floating near the upper section of the room where a floor would have been located in the past, positioned close to the doorway. People have also noted drastic fluctuations in temperature 
and an overall menacing atmosphere within the room, which seems to affect dogs as they bark, whimper, or simply refuse to enter. There's a room referred to as the third room that's been the site of many strange and unusual events. The following is taken from an account that happened in 2011. This incident occurred several years ago, around October or November 2011, during my time living in London and working as a study abroad advisor for American college students. Lately, it's been weighing heavily on my mind. As part of the programme I worked for, there was an optional trip to Scotland each semester, which began and ended with a night in Edinburgh, with a tour of the Highlands in between. A few students expressed interest in joining the walking tour of the Haunted Falls, though at the time I was sceptical of the haunted claims. I informed the students of the meeting time outside the hostel for the tour, expecting only a few to show up. To my surprise, nearly every one of them turned up, totalling around 30 or 40 kids. While the tour was primarily focused on historical facts, the ghost stories and haunted narrative felt somewhat gimmicky to me as the guide led us through three underground vaults. Nevertheless, students enjoyed themselves, which put me at ease knowing they were engaged in a safe activity. During the tour, the guide spoke of an entity residing in the third vault with an ambiguous appearance but a reputation for leaving scratches on visitors. The guide recounted eerie anecdotes, including one about a young girl claiming to have been led across the room by someone with three fingers. Although the setting was undeniably spooky, I maintained a sense of scepticism, dismissing it as a tourist trap. Upon returning to my room, I excitedly shared my experiences with my stepdad, a history professor over Skype. However, as I changed into my pyjamas, I made a chilling discovery three long, straight scratches running from just above my knee to my thigh, resembling cat or kitten scratches. I hadn't felt anything during the tour, leaving me thoroughly unsettled. I immediately called my best friend in London to witness the scratches over Skype before seeking confirmation from a few of the students who were equally taken aback. Later, a male student approached me, revealing three scratches behind his ear, mirroring my own experience. Earlier we mentioned the spirit of Mr. Boots, undoubtedly the most infamous resident of the vaults. Mr. Boots emanates a palpable aura of malevolence, his ghostly form exuding a chilling sense of foreboding that sends shivers down the spine of anyone who encounters him. His territorial demeanour hints at a secretive past prompting speculation about his potential involvement in illicit activities such as smuggling, thievery, or even body snatching to protect his wares. From the 1820s onwards, the Southbridge vaults served as a hub for unlawful endeavours. Regrettably, they also provided shelter for the most impoverished members of Edinburgh society. It's conceivable that the Watcher assumed the role of a sinister landlord preying on and exploiting the vulnerable residents who lacked the means to defend themselves. But as many people have speculated, could he either be Burke or Hare, prowling the nooks and crannies of the vaults, looking for someone vulnerable enough to lure back to their lodging house? Whoever Boots was, he's been regularly seen, felt, heard and even photographed. His presence is one that strikes fear into the hearts of those who are unfortunate enough to encounter him, and he leaves a lasting impression on anyone who catches sight of him. In 2009, a BBC crew picked up what they described as the last rites being read out by a lone male voice. The voice was recorded and can be clearly heard over the course of about 15 minutes. The recording was made in Boots' haunt when no one was present in the area. Could they have captured the aftermath of an attack by him? Or could they have captured the voice of Mr Boots? In modern Edinburgh ghost lore, the vaults are arguably the most famous or infamous location in the city, 
rivalled only by Greyfriars Kirkyard. Practically every one of TV's ghost hunting teams have investigated there. They feature regularly on the lists of the most haunted locations in the world and attract tourists, history buffs and lovers of the paranormal from far and wide, eager to experience their unique history and drink in the haunting atmosphere for themselves. Since the vaults have become a haven for tourists, there's no doubt that some of these stories have been embellished and associations made that may not be true. There's no evidence linking Burke and Hare's crimes to the vaults. But at the core of these tales are stories that ring true and experiences that can't be ignored. Too many people have had similar uncanny experiences that defy logical explanation. Whatever or whoever lingers in the vaults, their presence continues to captivate and unsettle all who dare venture into their shadowy depths, leaving an indelible mark on those who seek to unravel the mysteries of Edinburgh's haunted underworld. <laughs>